Hello everyone, this is Simon from writtenlegalenglish.com and welcome to this end of the week video where I'm going to go through that monstrous text I asked you to have a look at on Tuesday and explain how I would redraft that text into a shorter, plainer, but yet still professional piece of English writing. If you didn't see the video on Tuesday, this is the text that I am talking about. So if you want to try and redraft this into a simpler, plainer, but yet still professional uh, piece of English writing, then pause the video now, think about the tasks, and then come back to this video when you're ready. If you just want to see how I would do it, then let's get started. If you're planning to simplify a complicated text, there are a number of different approaches that you can take. And if you go back over my videos, I've gone through a number of those different approaches. In this particular case, I am looking for the easy wins. That is to say, the easy changes I can make keeping the same sentence structure or keeping the same order of information, but just simplifying where I can. And by doing that, I came up with this. The agreement between the exam centre and the student to administer a selected exam is considered to be entered into the moment of completing the exam registration upon the student paying the exam fee after the student's data is entered onto the list of candidates for a selected exam via the online registration system and the, exa the exam centre has on their website. Now, this is by no means a finished product. This is still one very long sentence. But I'm showing you this just to show you the process. That is to say that it's not always the case that you could analyze a piece of text and then just come up with a simplified version just like that. Often there is a process, often this takes time, often this involves discussion between uh, me as the copy editor or as the proofreader and the author themselves if I was doing this for a client. So I'm just going to show you some of the things, some of the changes I've made in this first redraft. So the first thing I've done is introduce humans or somehow make this um, this a lot more relatable to the person who's reading this. Now I could re use us and we and you, and that's also a very, very valid thing. And I talk about that on in my uh, online professional English uh, videos that I put out on Wednesday. I think it was lesson nine where I said, understand the importance of you and your. In this case, I've just said exam center and student. So the agreement between the exam center and the student the next change is the nominalization, the change of the nominalization to a strong verb. So administration is hiding the strong verb, a perfect example of a nominalization, and we could say to administer. And then we've got shall. Now I've done uh, numerous videos on shall and why we shouldn't use shall. I'll link to some of them below, so if you want to check out more information about that, then please have a look at those videos. Needless to say, we don't want to use shall, so understanding the text, or in, in my understanding of the text, I think it simply can just disappear and be replaced by a verb, in this case, is. Um, and then that leads on to another change where I've changed deemed to considered. Now, if you're doing the TOLS advanced exam, uh, one of the questions in the TOLS advanced exam is about changing legalese language, complicated legal language into simpler forms. Now, deemed, uh, considered is one step below deemed in terms of complexity. There are simpler ways to say or explain what deemed means. But I'm just showing you, as I said, a step-by-step -step process. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of the changes I've made here because there's no point. This is not the finished product. I'm just giving you an idea of the changes that you could make as a first step to working out what the main message is. And when you go through that process of making all of those changes, and please pause the video now if you want to compare those two texts, um, then once you get to that, the end of the first stage of that process, you can think, well, okay, I've made a number of changes, I think I've got a better idea of what the message actually is, and then that leads you on to the next stage of the process, which is simplifying that message. And if we were to do that, then we might come up with a message like this. Now, this is what I think 
the message is behind that horrible, complicated text. The student enters into an agreement with the exam centre, and we could say to take an exam, although the context might be clear enough that we don't need to say that, or it might be a good idea to say which exam. So, for example, it might be the, um, the tolls exam, or it might be a business exam, or it might be the uh, an advanced certificate in English, the old, uh, what, we, what I used to know as the CAE exam. And then to continue, when the student pays the exam fee after registering online on the exam centre's website. That's what I think the message should be in its simplest form. Now, I've cut out a whole load of information, and I would expect that the author of that original text may not be happy about that. And they might say, OK, well, we need this because this is important, and we need this because this is important. And then you've got to go through that process of justifying the need for that language. Do we really, really need to say that? Or is that just a glue word? Is that just unnecessary words that we think we need, but actually don't contribute to communicating the main message? And I would, of course, argue that those words are not needed, that this is the main message. But of course, that's, that's the let's say, a diplomatic discussion between someone uh, who works as a copywriter or a proofreader like I do and the author themselves. But in terms of understanding a, a provision in a contract, which is what I had to do, so there's, I didn't have the chance to work with the author who drafted this, I would just simply have to understand this. And if I had any questions, if I think I misunderstood it in some way, or if I wanted clarification, then I would have to phone up the exam centre and I would have to say, listen, I'm trying to understand the terms and conditions. Is this what the terms and conditions actually mean? Now, of course, if a text was worded well, then that step that involved me as the reader having to contact the writer to say, is this what you mean? That step is not necessary. It shouldn't happen. But that, unfortunately, is what happens when you have a badly worded, overworded text that the reader has got to then spend time, invest time, invest energy in trying to understand what's going on. And of course, that's one of the fastest ways that you're going to lose clients or potential custom. OK, guys, in this video, we touched on a wide range of plain language communication skills, skills which I go into in a lot more depth in my other videos. So if you want to see my content and not miss a thing, then please think about uh, liking me on Facebook, uh, subscribing on YouTube, connecting to me on LinkedIn. Or if you want to do my online uh, legal writing course, which will help you develop your professional English writing skills, then please think about joining me on Patreon. Okay, guys, have a great weekend, and I'll see you again on Tuesday.